Welcome to the inaugural lecture of our Professor of History this evening. Um, I know we've got colleagues from the University of Liverpool, University of, of Central Lancashire, and a few other friends from, from the region, and certainly several colleagues from across the faculties here. Inaugural lectures are very special events at this university because we don't pick our professors lightly. And when we do, we celebrate the uh, foundation of chairs at this university because it is the professors who are at the heart of um, our academic ambitions. History is the lifeblood of a humanities curriculum. And a strong department of history is vital for any university like ours that's shaped and formed by the liberal arts. And, all, and having said that, you look out the window and see that we are building a marvelous state-of-the-art science building. But um, in order to have good liberal arts, you need good science and you need good commerce. But it's shaped by a much larger vision, a university like ours, that informs all the disciplines. Being a church historian myself, I gave my first inaugural lecture, like Professor Williams is doing probably for the second time, uh, in Pretoria, the University of South Africa, where we were seeing the walls of apartheid crumble, that vicious system, uh, crumbling in the face of a new democracy that was being built were in front of us rapidly and beyond our wildest expectations um, as those of us who lived under that system. And I was challenged then, Professor Williams, to decide on what I'll speak as an ecclesiastical historian. And um, I was inspired for my title by Gabriel Marcel's work, Man Against Mass Society, because he was writing this in the face of Stalinism and Nazism. And he was speaking then about the danger of the fanaticized consciousness. Uh, and I thought, well, that's a topic that theologians in South Africa who led the struggle against apartheid uh, should reflect on after apartheid. Because there's no, there's no guarantee that the victims in one, under one system will not become the victimizers under something that replaces it. And the argument I made then was very simply this, that in the absence of a historical consciousness, we breed fanaticism, obsessive behavior like we're seeing at the moment, not just on our shores, but certainly in Paris recently and many parts of the world. The absence of a historical consciousness is the breeding ground for, for fanaticism. And so I strongly believe that the historians are not self-absorbed archivists. The historians have a very important cultural mandate in our time. And so when I begin by saying how important history is for the university, any university, certainly for this university, it is because we are very mindful that we all as academics have a cultural responsibility and a public responsibility. So it was great delight, ladies and gentlemen, that I invite you and welcome you to the university and invite Professor Newport, the Pro Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, to introduce our lecturer this evening, Professor Newport. May I also add my welcome to this inaugural lecture. You're very welcome here indeed. This is the second in the series uh, of inaugural lectures for the year. And our lecturer this evening is Professor Christopher Williams, uh, head of history and politics here at the university. And as I shall briefly outline, a scholar of some very considerable distinction. Often when I'm in introducing these lectures, I comment on how the university seeks to draw scholars from across the world, and we certainly do that. Well, the world, of course, does include Liverpool, from which fair city Professor Williams hails. Professor Williams was born on the north side of the city in 1959, 
And it was here that his interest in Eastern Europe was first sparked through the giving to him of a book on the 1968 Czech invasion written by the local MP, Eric Heffer. Professor Williams left school without the thought of attending university and for the next three years held various jobs, including that of a retail manager. And he returned to education, however, by attending Liverpool College of Further Education. And it was here at Liverpool College, while he was doing history, sociology, and economics at A-level, that at the sociology lecturer, John Kempton, introduced Professor Williams to the study of Russia, which is an interest that has remained with Professor Williams ever since. Professor Williams went on from there to continue his studies at the University of Portsmouth, from which in 1983 he obtained his first degree, a degree in Russian and Soviet studies, following master's level studies in Soviet economics and politics at Swansea, which was awarded in 1985. He took up an ESRC-sponsored PhD in history on the Soviet Health Service, a case study of Leningrad, 1917 to 1932, and that was at the University of Essex under the direction of Professor Steve Smith. Beginning in 1979, Professor Williams began his travels, and he's traveled frequently and extensively to the ex-USSR. As an undergraduate, he took social science Russian language courses in Krasnodar and Voronezh, <coughs> and also in Kiev, before spending a time, uh, the academic year in fact, 1981 to 1982 at Moscow State University in the history department. As a PhD student, he spent a further year in Leningrad State University, where he studied history from 1987 to 1988, and then a further year in Finland from 88 to 89, working in the Slavonic Library. Now, prior to taking up <coughs> the post at Hope, which he did in October 2013, Professor Williams taught at the universities of Amsterdam, Helsinki, Cork, and Central Lancashire. He's published 11 books, I've got time to name them all, I'm afraid, uh, published on a variety of areas, mostly relating to Russia, including health and wealth, welfare issues, and these include the following, AIDS in the post-communist post Russia and its successor states, published in 1995, a book entitled Russian Society in Transition in 96, and published in Russian, Social Policy Past and Present 2005. He's published widely in the area of youth and ethnicity, books including Young People in Post-Communist Russia and Eastern Europe, 1995, Youth in a Risk Society, 2001, Youth Risk and Russian Modernity in 2003, Ethnicity and Nationalism in Russia, 1999, Ethnicity and Nationalism in East Central Europe and the Balkans in 1999, and Linguistic and Ethnic Revival in Russia, 2008. And again, two of those books were published in Russian. And in addition, there are over 50 articles and book chapters. So it is very clear that despite being a historian, Professor Williams' research encourages both interdisciplinarity, crossing boundaries with sociology, politics, and linguistics. I say despite being a historian, probably because he is a historian. Professor Williams has served as the secretary of the British Association for Slavonic and East European Studies, and was made a member of the Russian Academy of Political Science in 2000, which is an honor rarely achieved by foreigners. In his talk this evening, Professor Williams returns to his first love, the social history of Russia, and draws upon his long-standing and very extensive knowledge of St. Petersburg. And so it is a great pleasure indeed now to invite Professor Williams to deliver his inaugural lecture to us, which is on the topic, The Forgotten Victims in Stalin's Purges, 1930 to 1938. Professor Williams. Sorry, I'm just going to remember to turn on my mic. Hopefully that's on. Okay. 
Welcome everybody. I would like to thank Professor Pillay for the invitation to deliver this lecture and Professor Newport for his kind words of introduction. I would also like to thank Professor Rees for his support and for awarding me a new professor's grant which allowed me to employ Dr. Yuri Basilov to work in St. Petersburg archives and collect some of the materials referred to in my talk. Most of all, I would like to acknowledge the support and encouragement given to me by my department administrator, Karen Quinn, and my colleagues in history, politics, and IR over the last 18 months at HOPE. I'm pleased to be at HOPE since October 2013, taking responsibility for leading the new department of history and politics. Our shared vision is one in which teaching is underpinned by high quality research, offering students from undergraduate first year through to MA level the opportunity to be taught by staff who are enthusiastic about their teaching and who are also well-published active researchers. I am pleased to see my colleagues as well as many of our undergraduate and postgraduate students in the audience tonight. The department did well in the REF 2014 and our plans are to do even better in the REF 2020. Our aim is to become one of the leading research departments in the faculty offering a range of successful MAs in history, international relations and peace studies. And also to increase our PhD student numbers, external research grants and most importantly to create a positive environment in which a culture of inquiry is developed and flourishes. I seek to lead by example and I hope the following talk will illustrate this. My talk focuses on a neglected area of Soviet history, something which I've been researching since the 1980s. It focuses on the period before 1918 to 32 and during Stalin's Great Terror, 1937-8. In the talk, I will assess the impact of the purges on one sector, healthcare, on one city and region, Leningrad, and on one occupational group, the medical profession. We will assess the medical profession according to age, gender, party membership, ethnicity, and so on. So far in many studies of the Stalin purges, this group has been overlooked, and for me it's a distinct category in Stalin's purges. The talk draws upon declassified Russian archival material from St. Petersburg and also on so-called victim studies, namely the numerous volumes of Leningradsky Martyrolog or Leningrad Martyrs. Most importantly, my talk seeks to challenge the intentionalist interpretation of Stalin's purges. When historians first started studying Stalin's purges, the first major work was Robert Conquest's seminal work, The Great Terror, 1968. This book focused upon the impact of the purges on the political elite and the military. When I was being trained as a social historian in Portsmouth in the 1970s, I was taught that history wasn't just about politics, it was about people. So over time since the 1970s, we've moved to focus on different sets of victims other than politicians. Ethnic groups, women, musicians and many others. As historians, we realized as time went on and as access to the Soviet archives became possible under Mikhail Gorbachev, who himself was an anti-Stalinist born in 1931 and whose family suffered under Stalin, that the victims of Stalin's purges were much more widespread than previously thought by Robert Conquest. This talk deals with some of those forgotten victims, the nurses, doctors, and other hospital and medical staff who worked for the Soviet state in the Stalin period. While Conquest's work portrayed the Great Terror as a carefully laid out plan, fully in Stalin's hands, others such as John Arch Getty of California in his book, The Origins of the Great Purges, has argued that things were in disarray in the Stalin era, with the regime moving from crisis to crisis and Stalin un unable to impose his will on anyone from the Communist Party at the top to the people at the bottom, and for that matter, everyone in the middle. 
This talk argues that the traditional totalitarian explanation of the terror is flawed and that the greater mass terrors of the 1930s were in fact a response to deep-seated crises threatening the Soviet state. These purges were used to impose revolutionary change on an unwilling polity, economy and society by Stalin. However, Stalin was a weak dictator in my opinion, so other national, region and local leaders, as well as other organisations, the security police, also played a major role. This talk, however, argues that the civil war of 1918-20 to 20 was a formative influence on Soviet mindsets, which coupled with numerous insecurities that evolved and developed over time, all shaped Soviet attitudes towards the use of violence, agencies of violence, surveillance, and the perception of who might be a friend, or more importantly in this talk, an enemy, a subversive and undesirable. Leaders may have changed, but the threats, real or imagined, remained. Finally, although it seems in the words of Evan Rees, no relation to Nick, that, Stalin laid, that Lenin laid the basis for Stalin state terror, this talk argues that Stalin may have modelled himself on Lenin, as Robert Tucker points out, but their purges were different in scope, different in context. Under Lenin, it was in the Revolution and Civil War period. Under Stalin, it was in peacetime. And it is the use of the same means, the secret police or the gulag, the labor camps, and as well as the same name, purge, that makes it look like a matter of continuity, when in fact it's not actually the case. In my view, and I hope to persuade you this evening, the great and mass terrors depicted here marked a radical and abrupt change of course. So how does the medical profession fit into the problem? Historians' views in Russia and the West of the relationship between Stalin and the medical profession have been shaped by the so-called doctor's plot. In January 1953, nine doctors linked to the Kremlin hospital in Moscow were accused of plotting to kill the leaders. At the time, the Soviet media created a climate of fear leading to empty doctor's clinics, patients refusing to seek medical advice, and rumors of poison medicines or murdered infants in maternity wards. One of the relatives of one of the survivors, Jakob Rapoport, in his book, The Doctor's Plot, states, and I quote, and it's on the screen here, every doctor was regarded as a saboteur, and so to seek medical aid at all was considered dangerous. Although this sad event had an anti-Semitic dimension, six of the nine doctors were in fact of Jewish origin, it was part of a clampdown on the so-called scientific intelligentsia. It seems that in the late Stalin era, the Soviet regime, and Stalin in particular, was suspicious about the loyalty of the medical profession. After 19... 53, and more particularly on the 5th of March that year, attitudes changed. Why? Because Stalin died. And these victims were released on the 3rd of April 1953. The accused were rehabilitated under Nikita Khrushchev's thaw, and in the era of Mikhail Gorbachev, 1985-91, to 91, it was then acknowledged that the plot had been fabricated. So what my talk seeks to ask is, why did Stalin fear doctors? Where did this fear come from? Were they an enemy from the start who needed to be eliminated? I'm sure there are some people in the audience who might attribute this fear to Stalin's paranoia or madness. This talk argues that that's not the case. That the formative influence was the revolution and civil war. Why? Because the period 1917 to 20 created a siege mentality which shaped Soviet perceptions of many groups, including doctors and the medical profession. This was also a crucial time because it's a time of Stalin's rise to power, a time of great insecurity for the Soviet state, and also a time when violence was deployed for regime survival. My 1991 article on war, revolution and medicine shows that sections of the czarist medical profession, such as the Perigov Society, so you've got Nikolai Pedagov here on the right, 
were considered to be hostile to the idea of socialism, hostile to revolutionary change, and associated with the liberal and conservative classes in Tsarist Russia. Members of this society supported the First World War, which the Bolsheviks viewed as imperialistic and wanted to withdraw out of, and also sent its members to serve at the front. Finally, many members of the Perigov Society supported Kerensky's provisional government of the 2nd of March 1917, after the Russian monarchy had abdicated. It's important to remember that following the October Revolution, the Bolsheviks faced two types of opposition. Opposition from the inside, the whites, consisting of Mensheviks, cadets and social revolutionaries, and opposition from outside, due to the threat of foreign intervention by countries such as Britain, France and Poland and many other states during the Civil War period. Some members of the medical profession supported the white opposition. So at the 7th Congress of Soviets in December 1917, Lenin famously said, there are still doctors who regard the working class government with prejudice and distrust and prefer to receive fees from the rich rather than throw themselves into the hard struggle against typhus. And this is captured in this image here. Part of this negative response was philosophical. The members of the Perigov Society and the Bolshevik government had different visions about what type of health service to create. Not all of them disagreed with the new government. In fact, some of them actively became key Bolshevik medical practitioners. Nevertheless, the Civil War period was important because it created an anti-Bolshevik perception of some members of the old regime and of some members of the medical profession. Some doctors naturally came from the old middle and upper classes, from the czarist and officer class, and were closely connected either to the conservative peasants or to the Russian Orthodox Church. And for those of you who like film, if you think of Pasternak's book, Dr. Zhivago, later made into an excellent film by David Lean, the doctor played by Omar Sharif captures that very conservative stereotype. So after the Civil War was won in the summer of 1920, those doctors who did not flee abroad, and about one million of them did, were expected to stay behind and defend the October Revolution, to defend the Soviet state, and to help build a new welfare state. My 1993 article on the 1921 famine shows that many doctors, nurses, and other staff actually put their lives on the line for the new state. Not because they believed in it ideologically, but they thought that was their responsibility as doctors and nurses. So from the Civil War onwards, 1920, the Communist Party in Russia regularly reviewed its members at periodic in intervals. In Russian, these are referred to as purges. The, purge, uh, the word purge in Russian means to cleanse. At the start and up to the late 1920s, some medical staff were expelled for corruption, others for so-called passivity, uh, passivity lack of political engagement, others for political opposition. What I'm going to argue is under Stalin, this process became much more deadly, no pun intended, leading to the arrest, imprisonment, and in many of the cases referred to later in my talk, execution. In the power struggle after Lenin's death in January 1924, the tide began to turn against the old bourgeoisie with some Bolsheviks believing that the doctors and nurses that had helped the regime survive had now served their purpose, pushing for a replacement by so-called proletarian cadres, as discussed in my 2005 article on combating elitism. If we look at a 1926 census of medical personnel in Leningrad, what it showed of is of nearly 11,500 staff, around half, 5,600, had been trained after 1906. It is clear that many members of the health service were trained under the 19th century Tsarist regime, with its belief in Zemstvo medicine. 
So there was some substance to the claim that doctors and others didn't necessarily share the socialist beliefs of the new regime. What this talk argues is this proletarian replacement process, which started in 1925-6, intensified after Stalin came to power in 1928. So while the social class origins and other characteristics of Tsarist trained doctors who had remained behind tried to keep their heads down and serve the Soviet state without drawing attention to themselves was becoming a growing concern. At the same time as Stalin was worried about doctors, he faced other challenges. The mid to late 1920s was also a time of rising insecurity in other ways. Sabotage, as epitomized by the Shakti or mining engineers. The failure of peasants to supply grain, leading to suspicion of so-called kulaks, rich peasants. And most of all, a fear of the outside world, in this case, a Japanese war scare of 1927. So how did doctors fit into this picture? In 1927-1928, as the pace of collectivization, the modernization of agriculture, but through the use of force, and industrialization increased at a very rapid pace, the health service started to feel the strain. It was unable for a variety of reasons, explored in my 1990 Essex PhD and 1994 article for Urban History, to meet the excessive demands placed on it. Health conditions declined, morbidity increased, nutritional levels and living standards plummeted. This was especially acute amongst peasants rather than industrial workers. Housing was unhygienic and overcrowded. Instead of blaming these problems on the flawed nature of the radical policies of Stalin, of course, Stalin shifted the blame. Doctors and other health service staff were blamed for not curing illness, preventing industrial accidents, infectious diseases, and so on. As these events unfolded in Leningrad, staff in the Smolensk district of the city in October 1927 came under criticism. One member of staff, Sofia Lade, the daughter of a director who'd been in the job for 12 years but was not a member of the party, was accused of using and exploiting health establishments for her personal gain. Anna Nikitina was said to be too individualist and blamed for shortages. Roman Yasensky, who was of noble origins and the son of a general, who before 1917 was an army captain, was seen as inept and only interested in his salary. He was portrayed as a careerist. So by the late 20s, early 1930s, there seems to be a growing perception of the SOP of the Soviet system, Stalin and the leadership, the bourgeois specialist trained uh, Tsarist trained medical staff had somehow wormed their way into the Soviet system of confidence. How did they do it? They had adapted. They had, in the words of some historians, started to speak Soviet. And they had gradually managed to obtain party cards which they used to hide their origins or for personal gain. At the same time, Stalin wanted to consolidate the socialist welfare state and run it along class lines. But it now appears from newly declassified party archive material from St. Petersburg, then called Leningrad, that some medical staff did not adhere to the said party line. For example, a 1931 purge cleansing report on the Leningrad Regional Health Service criticized some staff for failing to adopt this class line in the hospitalization of patients or in treating the patients when they came to hospital. What this simply means is not enough working class patients were admitted and treated in Leningrad hospitals. An illness doesn't necessarily follow a social class. A year earlier, a similar investigation was made of 1,500, uh, sorry, five enterprises with 1,500 workers served by 325 medical staff. What the report found was unhygienic conditions rudeness amongst med medical personnel and inefficient management. So you can see that the managers and health service staff are being blamed. Some staff were praised for treating the sick without pay, 
which was a role model others were encouraged to follow, but health service leaders, by and large, were blamed for these deficiencies. The Soviet state used a process of accusatory practices in these cases, whereby the so-called guilty, really innocent, were brought before a cleansing commission. In one case, and I shall call them Dr. X, was accused by another doctor of allegedly causing the death of a child. The accused Dr. X was in fact a well-educated person who'd gone to a St. Petersburg gym gymnasium. A gymnasium is a grammar school. And also went to St. Petersburg University, one of the best in Russia. Unfortunately for them, they had served in private practice. They had served on the front in World War I and only later served the Red Army. They were very late to join the Soviet Medical Trade Union in 1928. By the time these accusations were being made, they were working in a mother and babies unit in Leningrad. So what the commission did was they used these facts about Dr. X to allege that they had suspicious origins and values. So let's look at the case of this child. The child was sick at school on the 22nd of September 1930 and referred to a school nurse, who then said, Dr. X should look at the child. Dr. X wasn't sure if the child had an infectious disease, but said if they did and they needed treatment, it was going to cost 300 rubles. The fact that the Dr. X mentioned money suggests, in the view of the commission, capitalist tendencies. I'm only interested in profit. And that Dr. X was allegedly out for personal gain. Why was 300 rubles a lot of money? It was 20 to 30 times the price of butter in 1930. So it's quite a lot of money. The child went home and another doctor visited them and then they were sent to hospital three times. But the diagnosis was not properly explained. Eventually a second, a second home visit was made and a firm diagnosis was found. Scarlet fever. The home doctor phoned an ambulance and the child was admitted to hospital on the 28th of September. That's six days after the initial uh, child visit. At this point, the disease unfortunately was so serious that the child, a boy, died. What follows is um, a discussion in which Dr. X was present. So Dr. X is very rarely able to speak for herself and everybody else is accusing her of everything. So what you've got is a question where they say, Dr. X, did Dr. X provide medical aid to the child? And the audience shouts, no, but they, she was obliged to. Did Dr. X call an ambulance? No, she decided it was not necessary. Did the child live in an infectious quarter of Leningrad? This time the doctor tries to defend herself, but she avoids the question saying, when the disease was discovered, I took the necessary steps. But the accusers carried on. How many children live in the infectious quarter of Leningrad? Five is the answer. I wonder if the accuser is trying to imply here, did Dr. X potentially not just put one child at risk, but the other four? Then a question was asked, Dr. X failed to take the necessary measures to protect the child, and then a member of the audience, also trying to help, says, she is not guilty, I suggest you ask Dr. Y himself to confirm this. So while this exchange is going on, the doctor's sitting there, and you can imagine how difficult it must have been for her. Then one member of the audience, Sergeyeva, recommends to the cleansing commission that action be taken against Dr. X for failing to do her duty. The chairman initially says, yes, of course. Then an unknown contribution from the audience goes as follows. Dr. X does not have the essential qualities to be a good school doctor and does not possess the appropriate attitudes towards her work. So you would think that that's the end of Dr. X. However, in 1930, it was possible for others to try and defend their colleague. 
So Dr. X's medical colleagues started to try and change the verdict, change the outcome. Another doctor from the floor shouted, Dr. X is a committed school director who's interested in pursuing her profession. Another doctor, Gorovich, said, maybe Dr. X made mistakes because her father is an invalid, her mother is an old age pensioner. Members of the audience also said that Dr. X first saw the child on the 26th of September and did not realize how serious the situation was. Ordered an ambulance, but there was none available and found an alternative and then accompanied the child to the hospital. Dr. X was calm, as was the child. This implies that Dr. X was in fact a caring and very professional individual. Also, it was discovered that the child was well when they arrived at the hospital, but deteriorated in the night. And it was pointed out that the scarlet fever diagnosis was not made until much, much later. So what all this implies is that, in a sense, doctors were being brought to be accused and prosecuted in, in public places, almost like a spectacle. And they were having to defend themselves. Having listened to all this dialogue, the Cleansing Commission seems to have changed its mind. Instead, it shifted the blame onto the Leningrad Health Service Department and its leadership, arguing that it needed to take the necessary measures and not prosecute Dr. X. That more home visits were required, that the Health Department needed to give clear guidelines and procedures in such cases. So given that the blame was shifted from Dr. X to the health service leaders, the commission concluded that we shouldn't blame Dr. X, but in fact Dr. X needed more support and extra training and guidance. Sadly, the commission noted at the very end that the child's condition was bad, implying perhaps that nothing could be done no matter how good you are. So this 1930 Purge case shows that doctors were able to speak up, close ranks, and defend Dr. X from attack, and move the blame from the doctor onto their superiors. This was possible in 1930, but in 1934, and more importantly in 1937-8, such a response was increasingly dangerous. If you tried to defend somebody that was seen as an enemy, you risked guilt by association. So what my analysis shows is that in the early Stalin period, the government was worried about health service performance and using the social origins and loyalty of its staff as one reason for explaining the crisis. In October 1930, when a review was carried out of the Leningrad Regional Health Department by the Cleansing Commission, they found some interesting facts. That in fact, 104 out of the 150 members of the medical profession were not members of the party. 10% came from a working class background, 20% were peasant, 13% were white collar, 19% were petty bourgeois, 2% were children of merchants, 3% were from the aristocracy, another 3% were children of landowners, and 2% were children of craftsmen. The other 25% we don't know what their social class is. But what the implication is here is problems in the health service arise because of the social composition of the workforce. They're concerned about poor performance, disloyal staff, party membership. So what the commission recommended in 1930 was to restructure the health service and improve its work by emphasizing more health care for factory workers, improving the health education of the workers themselves, stressing not just hundreds and hundreds of doctors, but putting quality doctors in place and cutting red tape. This led to a management restructure and the sacking of those found wanting. Stalin justified this policy by reference to Lenin, who at, earlier in the Civil War period had argued that the problems that I'm describing stemmed from, and I quote, the prejudices of old, awkward, preposterous, vile, and disgusting upper classes 
who were against building socialism and a socialist state. The 1920s and early 1930s were a time of major transformation, what I term the revolutions from above, where you've got rapid industrialization and forced collectivization implemented through central planning. At the same time, what Stalin wanted to do was legitimate the new Soviet or Stalinist uh, welfare state by replacing Tsarist medical personnel with those from a working class or peasant background. So already in the late 1920s and early 1930s, Stalin saw the medical profession as opponents of his ambitious healthcare policy. Prior to 1934, Stalin and the leadership appear to, however, to have taken a mild and modest stance, using a process of criticism and self-criticism here on this PowerPoint, as detailed earlier. After 1934, and more importantly, after the assassination of Sergei Kirov, the leader of the Leningrad Party organization, the mood and atmosphere changed. At this time, continued resistance to Stalin's policies by ex-Kulaks, themselves victims of collectivization, resistance by hooligans, black marketeers, petty criminals and beggars, which generated law and order concerns and led to the introduction of residency laws and passports, resulted in a response from the Stalinist state, a search for all types of enemies, simply labeled anti-Soviet or socially harmful, all allegedly linked to the political enemies of the Stalinist state symbolized by Trotsky, although he lived in exile. Later on, widened to include other political leaders, as epitomized by the famous Stalinist show trials of the 1930s. David Scherer's work shows that Stalin sought to not just eradicate uh, political enemies, but to somehow create pure communities, with workers seen as good, and the bourgeoisie, of which the medical profession was a prime example, as alien or bad. So what I'm about to argue is the great and mass terrors of 1934 to 8 were used to reshape Soviet society. And this explains the possible connection between the great terror, the political terror, and the mass operations, social. At this time, some groups were viewed as a threat to social order, others to the political order. And what happened was, as these two groups came together in a real or imagined sense, policy lines gradually converged from the mid to late 1920s. So what did all this mean for the medical profession in 1937-8? In the final part of my talk, I want to explore the value of the Leningrad Martyr books. These books are based on various archives, in this case in Leningrad, personal memoirs, family recollections, and they're really good sources for historians wanting to know the multiple identities of the victims of Stalin's purges. So these volumes, which started to be published in 1995, and so far there's 11 of them, are around six to 800 pages long. They include basic bibliographical data on the victims of the mass terror in Leningrad city and region in 1937-8. We are now able, through these uh, Leningrad martyr books, to assess the occupation of the victim of Stalin's peerages, their date and place of birth, their nationality, whether they were a member of the party, when they were arrested, when they were put on trial, who arrested them, under what criminal code they were charged, and sadly, the date of their execution, or if we're very lucky, subsequent rehabilitation. So the next slide shows a typical um, entry for this period, and I picked a doctor as my example. So this is a female doctor, and this is my translation from Russian into English of the details that you will find on a typical page of these books. They're all in alphabetical order. There's no index saying doctors, so it takes an awful long time to plow through these things. Scholars such as Melanie Illich and Denis Kuzlov have utilized the Leningrad Martyr volumes to analyze trends 
and the impact of the pages on women, Illich, or in general on Leningrad, Kuzlov. Here I extend the analysis to focus upon another repressed group. The figures re referred to from now on in my talk relate to the number of medical professionals killed. These numbers were determined by a quota. So if you're a totalitarian historian, you say Stalin set the quota. If you're a revisionist historian, and I'm one of them, we say that the quotas were set by a dialogue between center and region. So there's a push from the top and a push from the bottom. From July 1937 onwards, there were two main operations in which people were arrested. One, Order 00447, was against kulaks, criminals, the village clergy, religious activists, nobles, and so-called anti-Soviet or hostile elements. The other was geared towards members of different ethnic groups, in particular Germans, Poles, and Finns, and so on. Between August and December 1937, approximately 18,500 were executed under 00447 in Leningrad city and region alone. The Leningrad region was very multinational, and it still is today. Since March 1935, Finns, Estonians, and Latvians were deported to other parts of the USSR, in particular Central Asia and Siberia. But by 1937-8, a change of policy occurred. There were various so-called national operations, by which I mean ethnic operations, against members of different ethnic groups. In particular, those targeted were of German origin, who worked in the military factories, defense, and on the railways in Leningrad city and region. These were covered by Order 00439. Between August 37 and November 38, 2,900 alleged German spies in Leningrad were either executed or imprisoned in the Gulag. Poles, too, posed a threat. 6,597 Poles were executed in the so-called Polish operation. Most of these Poles were active members of the Polish military or socialist organizations. Terry Martin explains this by arguing there was a Stalinist fear of foreign influence and contamination. So enemies inside were now connected to enemies outside. So the questions that I pose is, does occupation matter? Can a job make someone a victim? Where doctors and nurses caught up as innocent victims in the aforementioned national and Kulak operations, or were they victims in their own right, targeted by Stalin as negative, destructive elements? To answer these questions so far, I've analyzed five of the 11 volumes. The number of victims in those volumes is over 190,000. I'm only going to focus on 820 of these victims. These are medical assistants, bacteriologists, neurologists, nurses, surgeons, pharmacists, psychiatrists, pediatricians, gynecologists, and so on. So when I analyzed the 820 by occupation, painstakingly working my way through five volumes of the 11, this is what I found. The large majority, as shown on this slide, 323, were simply normal hospital staff. 774 of them were medical assistants, that's those assisting doctors, with everybody else coming from a range of personnel. So these are just normal health service workers who were killed and executed. We can also look at this group by how old they are which is the next slide. Most, the large majority of the victims in my case, the 820, are aged between 21 and 60. 21 and 60 year olds are 85% of my sample. So these are some people who've been working for the health service for an awful long time, and some people who've not been working for it very long. The next slide, 
appropriate for International Women's Day, and I would like to congratulate Sonia and Susan for a very successful T2 conference, by the way. We're also able to look at these victims by gender. And this, this aspect has been examined in greater detail by Professor Melanie Illich. In my case study, nearly three quarters of my medical establishment victims were males, nearly 73%, with just over a quarter female, 27%. Although in some cases a woman's fate was linked to the accusations made against their husband, so in some cases the husband was a doctor and the wife became a victim, or it was a brother and the sister became a victim, so in these cases they might be um, arrested under so-called order number 00486, wives of enemies of the people. However, some women were arrested in their own right, why? Because they were members of non-Bolshevik political organizations or the church. We can also examine my medical victims by their ethnicity, which is the next slide. It is clear that the majority of what I'm going to call medical martyrs were, in absolute terms, were Russian ethnicity by descent, 323 followed by Poles, 53, Latvians, 35, Estonians, 31. There were smaller numbers of Germans, 16, Ukrainians, 14, and Finns, 14. 26 of my 817 were Jewish. I know Jewish is not an ethnicity, but for some reason, Russians think in this period that Jewish constitutes an ethnicity. We can also assess them in terms of, did your party membership make a difference? The problem we have here is that over half of my sample, we don't know what their party membership is, 481 of them. Of the ones we do know, 31% were either candidate members of the party, meaning they couldn't vote in decisions, or full members, meaning they had the right to vote. Only one member of my medical profession was in the party at the time they were, the purges were carried out and expelled and executed. We now know that the Communist Party was a victim of the mass operations, but the bulk of my medical staff, in fact, were non-party members. That's quite typical, I think, for a medical profession. Often they're not about their political values. Thus, in my case study, 292, or nearly 36%, were non-party members. And a few of them, only 1%, 11 people, said they were members of other parties. Socialist revolutionaries, Mensheviks, Greens, cadets. So do all these things make them criminals? Health service staff were arrested under various parts of the criminal code. The 1926 Criminal Code created a particular article, Article 58. All it says is political offences. Under that code and its subsections, all my medical personnel were charged. So under Article 5810, and we've got 256 of them, they were charged with propaganda or agitation against Soviet power or counter-revolution. Article 5811, 135 of them, for distributing propaganda of that nature. Others, under 586, for espionage. 587, attacking state industry. 588, terrorism. 589, wrecking. So, they're being charged under various parts of the criminal code. The final slide, at least of tables, should, looks at the role of the security services. We all rely on the security services, don't we, to hunt down terrorists or alleged terrorists. In the Stalin period, the NKVD, the security services, and the legal system were responsible for catching, processing, convicting, and sadly in my cases, executing those found guilty. This slide illustrates that 176 cases were dealt with by a special troika. 
a troika of the police, the security services and the prosecutor. 101 cases were handled by the Dvojka, the regional head of the security services plus the chief prosecutor. Other political organizations connected to the security services dealt with other cases. It is generally believed that the Leningrad operations were very well organized and their arrests were based on information supplied by different security or organs. The security organs, however, never did it by themselves. They relied on informers to denounce victims and if that failed, torture and other interrogation techniques were used. In my view, the, the victims may have had jobs in the health service, but were mainly arrested for their political past, for their social or ethnic origins, and or for their religious beliefs. Many of the victims were secretly put in a burial site in the village of Lavasheva, and this is the contemporary version of that. So let me now reach my conclusions. We now know the purges under Stalin were much more complicated than conquest first thought. This talk, based on declassified Russian archives and several volumes of Leningrad martyrs, shows that these sources are extremely valuable in order to study terror at a local and regional level. These materials enable historians to assess the widening scope of the purges and to identify new victims, members of the medical profession in my case. Hopefully you've seen that the early Soviet regime viewed some members of the medical profession with suspicion. Why? Because of their liberal and conservative views, their social background or their alleged white associations. This view was shaped by the revolution and civil war context. After 1920, many members of the medical profession served the Soviet regime. But from the mid to late 20s, the political atmosphere changed. These ex-whites, nobles, aristocrats, and members of religious communities were now viewed with renewed suspicion as the search for foreign spies, nationalists, and socially, socially harmful elements gradually got underway. If we interpret these events from the perspective of the 1953 doctor's plot and look backwards, then it's possible to argue that Stalin disliked the medical profession and saw them as a threat dating back to the Civil War. And hence, when the opportunity came in 1937-8, he intentionally targeted them. This talk challenges that view and argues that victims had multiple identities. They had different genders, different nationalities, different jobs, different political affiliations. And while here I focus on occupation as a possible reason for becoming a victim of Stalinist repression and point out that the medical profession was criticized for not fulfilling state health policies, it is not that simple. Circumstances were much more influential. Thus as things became more chaotic and one health crisis led to another, Stalin used terror to impose the changes he desired. Doctors, nurses and others became victims in 1937-8 as the police and security services launched their sweeping mass operations against so-called dangerous elements. Whilst this strategy was targeted towards hostile kulaks, nationalists, criminals and other alleged anti-Soviet elements, the medical profession was caught up in it. There are numerous reasons for this. Firstly, those medical staff who had the wrong nationality, German, Polish, Finnish, Ukrainian, were in 1937-8 seen as emigre enemies and now linked with foreign spies. Second, those doctors and nurses and medical staff with undesirable political values, private versus state medicine, or who failed to implement state policy, were increasingly seen as medical saboteurs. Finally, some medical staff also came from unacceptable social classes within a worker's state, upper or middle class, or for that, for that matter, kulak or else they held religious values which put them in a hostile category. This process of identifying victim by category was part of Stalin's social and political engineering experiment that aimed at cleansing the Soviet state of its critics, of its enemies, of its undesirables, and building his conception of a perfect socialist society and a Soviet health service. 
The formative influence was the Civil War, when, as Ian Laughlin argues, the Soviet regime started its information gathering, processing, and threat perception process, and sentenced by category, and sought not to punish, but to repress and destroy so-called aliens. The medical profession was a possible exception to this rule initially. It was not really punished from 1917 to 27, as it was needed to help the new Soviet state to deal with its health challenges. But from 1928 after 1934 and by 1937 8, the unanticipated crises and Stalin's desire to reshape the USSR led to a class war against the medical profession. Although they constitute less than 1% of the total in my survey of over 190,000 victims in Leningrad, the health service workers who were perished still deserve not to be forgotten. Anna Akhmatova once said, I would like to call them all by name, all meaning the victims of Stalinist repression. Thanks to the Leningradsky Martyrologue and the opening up of Russian archives, we now know the names of the dead. We can now better understand who was a victim and why they were chosen. Thankfully, as this final slide shows, there is now a memorial in Lavashiva Cemetery on the former NKVD burial site to remember all those who perished in the terror in Leningrad. If you ever get to St. Petersburg, a most beautiful city, by the way, try to pay a visit. At the start of June and on the 30th of October each year, everyone remembers the victim of Stalinist repression and special buses take you there. I would like to thank you for listening. Vice Chancellor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Professor Williams for his provocative and insightful inaugural professorial lecture tonight. In his lecture, Professor Williams has challenged us to think about the forgotten victims in Stalin's purges, particularly between 1930 and 38. I suppose in many respects this also raises questions about the very nature of that political system in the then Soviet Russia, as well as maybe today, even in Russia, as we see it unfolding before us. However, clearly it's not just a Russian story. In some ways, the topic's fascinating, if a disturbing one, because it also causes us to think both historically and about contemporary situations in which dictators and the like are able to inflict misery and violence on many millions our citizens. Unfortunately, as the daily news reminds us, people in states such as Syria, Ukraine, North Korea, and elsewhere endure organized and systematic violence. So I think this case study, as we think about it, has wider repercussions. And certainly for me, as Professor Williams talked, it inspired me to think about some of the other situations we face today, and certainly as a political scientist. In his lecture tonight, I think Professor Williams has also given us a feeling and flavour for the type of historical research in which he is engaged and on which he teaches, particularly a postgraduate course in this area. We've been fortunate, I think, today to listen to a scholar who has mastery of his subject matter and his work really does reflect a lifetime of dedicated scholarship. I'm very aware that Professor Williams and his academic journey has involved much hard work and indeed some considerable hardship. In undertaking research in Soviet and now Russian studies, he's had to master Russian, which he's achieved through much work and study, both in Russia and in the UK. I suspect what motivates Professor Williams is a passion about his subject and a desire to share it with a wider audience which he's demonstrated to us tonight. In understanding his lecture, we need to be very cognizant that he's demonstrated through his careful archival research how one may help to answer critical questions through historical interpretation. I'm reminded of E. H. Carr and his seminal work on what is history, first published in 1961, in which he argued 
History consists of a corpus of ascertained facts. The facts are available to the historians in documents, inscriptions, and so on. Like fish on the fishmonger's slab, the historian collects them, takes them home, and cooks and serves them in whatever style appeals to him. Now, of course, he was writing in 61. This suggests, I suppose, that facts in some ways can be ascertained, empiricism perhaps, and then interpreted, which in turn raises questions about the relativism of history. It is, of course, worth recalling that Carr himself was writing at a time when, and had been a diplomat, obviously, and was himself a Soviet specialist. In his research today, Professor Williams has focused on two periods in Soviet history. 1918 to 32 and the Great Terror 1937 to 38, where he's looked specifically at the purges in the healthcare sector and in one city region, Leningrad. His research, I think, as you can see, is meticulous in that he draws on Russian archival material and I think what we might call victim studies today, i.e. the Leningrad martyrs. He sets out to challenge and to demonstrate to us that the intentional interpretation may not be sufficient to understand what went on around the purges of the medical profession. He provides for us details in this research of many of the forgotten victims, as we've seen tonight on the PowerPoints, of that Soviet state, medical staff in particular. His research challenges the conventional view that the Great Terror was a carefully laid out plan, fully in Stalin's hands. He argues that the purges of the 1930s were a response to the deep-seated crisis threatening the state, and they were used to impose revolutionary change on an unwilling polity, economy, and society by Stalin and other leaders, both at national and I think local level. He also suggests that the purges in this later period were different from the actions undertaken during the Civil War. I think this is a very nuanced account and that he argues that this constituted a radical and abrupt change of course. So we've got a very carefully crafted piece of work here, and I think we could discuss it in far more detail, I suspect some of you may wish to ask Professor Williams questions afterwards, but I think in his scholarship and in his journey that he's embarked on with us this evening, I think we are deeply aware of the type of research in which he's exploring and seeking to uncolor and examine tragic events such as those that happened in Soviet Russia. I think as a university, we are committed to exploring such topics, uh, and they resonate really with our commitment to social justice, um, which we exemplify for our teaching and research. So I'm really very assured uh, tonight that Professor Williams, in his work, makes a contribution for his teaching and research of this university, very much to our mission and value. As a university, we're also very proud of the Department of History and Politics, which I think is achieving great things under Professor Williams' leadership. In the 2014 submission to the Research Excellence Framework in the UK, we were really delighted with the quality of internationally recognised research within this department, and some of the impact cases being undertaken. The department also very much places students squarely and centrally at the heart of all it does. It really does invite that mission. And it's led in the areas of field work and developing links with the cities, museums, galleries, and other heritage sites. So we're really very pleased with what goes on here. As I come to a close, I'd like to thank Professor Williams for his continuing contribution to hope. And we look forward to further great things from him. So thank you very much. We began the evening by tr trying to underline the importance of history at our university. Uh, I was talking to some folk uh, just the other day who are doing research on memory. And uh, the remarkable findings when testing people with the onset of Alzheimer's or amnesia, we find that we all know that the, the, the memory goes but the tests about for imagination showed that 
the less they remembered, the more they imagined about the future. They were given examples about trying to envisage the next three, next three years or the next five years or the next ten years. And in fact, the, the bigger the loss of memory, the bigger the loss of imagination. And that's so true, I think, when we have an absence of historians who say to us, lest we forget, uh, lest we forget the past, and lest we um, have, lest we lose the long view, we begin to see that it's impossible to imagine the future. And a university like ours, therefore, is enriched by it. May I also say, without embarrassing him, uh, Professor Williams, how, how extraordinary it is to have amongst us somebody who actually knows the languages they're working in, and to be able to translate very difficult Russian texts and be able to make this accessible to an English audience is quite a wonderful uh, talent and a gift, and we're very, very grateful. I know we have a couple of other Russians on staff we greatly appreciate in psychology, and one of our mathematicians is a top-rated, uh, is Russian as well, top-rated mathematicians. They bring a richness to our community, the point that um, Professor Newport made earlier about building consciously an international community of scholars. So, Professor Willi uh, Williams, congratulations from all of us. Would you come forward, please, and accept a little memento for the evening? This is a plaque we give to all our new professors that not only remembers today, but also cites the date and cites the topic. And congratulations from all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.